Jamaica. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Story Time. Yes, we're back with the Jungle Book Part Seven. I don't know. I just wrote it down. I think we've come to the end of our Mowgli tales for the time being. Whether he comes back or not, that's uh, to find out later on. Basically, I'm going to find out. Spoilers. Yeah. I'm not sure if we will. Anyway, we're going to be on a different sail today. This one's to do with the seaside. Yay! Kind of. The ocean, beaches, that kind of thing. Yeah, different animals, different characters, different accents. Oh. So, I'm going to dive straight in. This chapter is called The White Seal. And there's a little seal lullaby to start with. Oh, hush thee, my baby, the night is behind us. And black are the waters that sparkle so green. The moon over the comas looks downward to find us, at rest in the hollows that rustle between. Where billows meet below, there soft be thy pillow, ah, weary we flipperling, curl at thy ease. The storm shall not wake thee, nor shark overtake thee, asleep in the arm of the slow swinging seas. <laughs> That's quite good, I'm going to stop there, all right? <laughs> <clears throat> All these things happened several years ago at a place called Novostochna, or North End Point, on the Isle of St. Paul, away and away in the Bering Sea. There are lots of uh, names which I, if I can't pronounce them, we'll all get over it together, hopefully. Lemushin, the winter wren, told me the tale when he was blown out onto the rigging of a steamer going to Japan, and I took him down into my cabin and warmed and fed him for a couple of days, till he was fit to fly back to St. Paul's again. Limushin is a very old little bird, but he knows how to tell the truth. Nobody comes to Novostoshna except on business, and the only people who have regular business there are the seals. They come in the summer months by hundreds and hundreds of thousands out of the cold grey sea, for Novostoshna Beach has the finest accommodation for seals of any place in all the world. Sea Catch knew that, and every spring would swim from whatever place he happened to be in, would swim like a torpedo boat straight for Novostoshna, and spend a month fighting with his companions for a good place on the rocks as close to the sea as possible. Sea Catch was 15 years old, a huge grey fur seal with almost a mane on his shoulders, and long, wicked dog teeth. When he heaved himself up on his front flippers, he stood more than four feet clear of the ground, and his weight, if anyone had been bold enough to weigh him, was nearly 700 pounds. He was scarred all over with the marks of savage fights, but he was always ready for just one more fight. He would put his head on one side, as though he was afraid to look his enemy in the face. Then he would shoot it out like lightning, and when the big teeth were fixed firmly on the other seal's neck, the other seal might get away if he could, but Sea Catch would not help him. That's charming, that is. That's charming. Yet, Sea Catch had never chased a beaten seal, for that was against the rules of the beach. He only wanted room by the sea for his nursery. But as there were forty or fifty thousand other seals hunting for the same thing each spring, the whistling, bellowing, roaring and blowing on the beach were something frightful. From a little hill called Hutchinson's Hill, you could look out over three and a half miles of ground covered with fighting seals, and the surf was dotted all over with the heads of seals hurrying to land and between their share of fighting. They fought in the breakers, they fought on the sand, and they fought on the smooth-worn basalt rocks of the nurseries, for they were just as stupid and unaccommodating as men. Their wives never came to the island until late in May or early in June, for they didn't care to be torn to pieces. And the young two, three or four year old seals who had not begun housekeeping went inland about half a mile through the ranks of the fighters and they played on about the sand dunes in droves and legions and rubbed off every single green thing that grew. They were called the Holuschiki, the bachelors. And there were perhaps two or three hundred thousand of them at Nova Stoshina alone. Sea Catch had just finished his 45th fight one spring when Matka, his soft, sorry, Matka, his soft, sleek, gentle-eyed wife, came up out of the sea, and he caught her by the scruff of the neck and dumped her down on the reservation, 
saying gruffly, Late as usual, where have you been? He's from the north, apparently. It was not the fashion for sea cats to eat anything during the four months he stayed on the beaches, and so his temper was generally bad. Mutka knew better than to answer back. She looked round and cooed. How thoughtful of you. You've taken the old place again. I should think I had, said Sea Catch. Look at me. He was scratched and bleeding in twenty places. One eye was almost blind, and his sides were torn to ribbons. Oh, you men, you men, Mutka said, fanning herself with her hind flipper. Why can't you be sensible and settle your places quietly? You look as though you've been, you've been fighting with a killer whale. I haven't been doing anything but fight since the middle of May. The beach is disgracefully crowded this season. I've met at least a hundred seals from Lucanon Beach. House hunting. Why can't people stay where they belong? I've often thought we should be much happier if we hold out. At Otter Island instead of this crowded place, said Mutka. Bah! Only the hollish chicken go over to Otter Island. If we went there, we'd say they would say we were afraid. Mm -hmm. We must... We must preserve appearances, my dear. Seacatch sunk his head proudly between his fat, his fat shoulders and pretended to go to sleep. Go to sleep. Yes, go to sleep. <clears throat> for a few minutes. But all the time he was keeping a sharp lookout for a fight. Now all, all the seals and the wives were on the land. You could hear their clamour miles out to sea, above the loudest gales. Didn't really sound like that. That was one, three, two. <laughs> Ahem. Loudest girls, yes. At the lowest counting, there were over a million seals on the beach. Old seals, mother seals, tiny seals, baby seals, and holuschiki, fighting, scuffling, bleating, clawing and playing together, going down to the sea and coming up from it in gangs and regiments, lying over every foot of ground as far as the eye could see, and skirmishing about in brigades through the fog. It's nearly always foggy in Nova Scotia. Except when the sun comes out and makes everything look all pearly and rainbow-coloured for a little while. Kotick, Mutka's baby, was born in the middle of that confusion, and he was all head and shoulders, with pale, watery blue eyes, as tiny seals must be. But there was something about his coat that made his mother look at him very closely. See, Catch, she said at last, our baby's going to be white! Empty clun shells and dry seaweed, snorted Sea Catch. There's never been such a thing in all the world as a white seal. I can't help that, said Mutka. There's, there's going to be one now. And she sang the low crooning seal song that all the mother seals sing to their babies. <clears throat> you mustn't swim till you're six weeks old, or your head will be sunk by your heels. And summer gales and killer whales are bad for baby seals. Are bad for baby seals, dear rat, as bad as bad can be. But splash and grow strong, and you can't be a wrong child of the open sea. Who would call that child baby rat? Dear rat. Don't do that. Of course, the little fellow did not understand the words at first. He paddled and scrambled about by his mother's side, and learned to scuffle out of the way when his father was fighting with another seal, and the two rolled and roared up and down the slippery rocks. Matka used to go to the sea to get things to eat, and the baby was fed only once in two days. But then he ate all he could, and throve upon it. Oh, that's a word you don't get anymore. Throve. I think that means thrived. I'm going to assume that's what it means. Food! The first thing he did was to crawl inland, and there he met tens of thousands of babies of his own age. And they played together like puppies, went to sleep on the clean sand, and poured again. The old people in the nurseries took no notice of them, and the holuschiki kept to their own grounds, so the babies had a beautiful playtime. When Mutka came back from her deep-sea fishing, she'd go straight to their playground and call, as a sheep calls for a lamb, <coughs> and wait until she heard Kutik bleat. <coughs> it says bleat, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Then she'd take the straightest of straight lines in his direction, striking out with her four flippers and knocking the youngsters head over heels right and left. There were always a few hundred mothers hunting for their children through the playgrounds, and the babies were kept lively. But, as Mutka told Kutik, um, So long as you don't lie in muddy water and get mange or rub the hard sand into a cut or scratch, 
And so long as you never go swimming, where there's a heavy sea, nothing will hurt you here. Little seals can no more swim than little children, but they are unhappy till they learn. The first time that Kotick went down to the sea, a wave carried him out beyond his depth, and his big head sank, and his little hind flippers flew up ex exactly as his mother had told him in the song. And if the next wave had not thrown him back again, he would have drowned. What did the song say? Hang on. You mustn't swim here. Your head will be sunk by your heel. Oh, yes, yes. yes. So basically, they're head heavy. So. Yeah. But he didn't drown, so it's all good. After that, he learned to lie in a beach pool and let the wash of the waves just cover him and lift him up while he paddled. But he always kept his eye open for big waves that might hurt. He was two weeks learning to use his flippers, and all that while he floundered in and out of the water and coughed and grunted and crawled up the beach and took cat naps on the sand and went, hang on a second, he's a rat, he's a sheep, he's a cat, he's a seal. I mean, hey, hey, He went back again and again until at last he found that he truly belonged to the water. Then you can imagine the times that he had with his companions, ducking under the rollers or coming in on top of a coma and landing with a swash and a splutter as a big wave went whirling far out the beach, or standing up on his tail and scratching his head as the old people did, or playing I'm the king of the castle on slippery, weedy rocks that just stuck out of the wash. Now and then he'd see a thin fin, like a big shark's fin, drifting along close to the shore, and he knew that that was the killer whale, the grampus, who eats young seals when he can get them, and Kotick would head for the beach like an arrow, and the fin would jig off slowly, as if it were looking for nothing at all. Hmm. Late in October, the seals began to leave St. Paul's for the deep sea, by families and tribes, and there was no more fighting over the nurseries, and the holus chicky played anywhere they like. Next year, said Mutka to Kotick, you will be a holus chicky, but this year you must learn how to catch fish. They set out together across the Pacific, and Mutko showed Kotick how to sleep on his back with his flippers tucked down by his side and his little nose just out of the water. No cradle is so comfortable as the long rocking swell of the Pacific. When Kotick felt his skin tingle all over, Mutko told him he was learning the feel of the water. And a tingly, prickly feelings meant bad weather coming, and he must swim hard and get away. In a little time, she said, you'll know where to swim to. But just now we'll follow Sea Pig. The porpoise. He's very wise. A school of porpoises were ducking and tearing through the water, and little Kotick followed them as fast as he could. Oh, this is the first time he speaks. How do you know where to go to? he panted. The leader of the school rolled his white eyes and ducked under. Ducked under. My tail tingles, youngst tingles, youngster, he said. That means there's a gale behind me. Come along. When you're south, south of the sticky water, he meant the equator. And your tail tingles, that means there's a gale in front of you and you must head north. Come along! The water feels bad here. This was one of the very many things that Kotick learned, and he was always learning. Mutska taught him the following, that following, uh, taught, taught him to follow Cod and the halibut along the undersea banks and wrenched the rocking out of his hole, out of his hole among the weeds. And wrenched, oh sorry, wrenched the rockling out of his hole among the weeds, how to skirt the wrecks lying a hundred fathoms beneath the water and dart like a rife bullet in one porthole and out of the other as the fishers ran, how to dance on top of the waves when the lightning, lightning was racing all over the sky and wave his flipper pointedly to, to the stumpy-tailed albatross and the man-of-war hawk as they went down the wind, how to jump three or four cle feet clear of the water like a dolphin, flippers close to the side and tail curved, to leave the flying fish alone, because they're all bony. To take the shoulder piece out of a cod at full speed, ten fathoms deep, and never to stop and look at a boat or a ship, particularly a rowboat. At the end of six months, what Kotick didn't know about deep sea fishing was not worth the knowing. And all that time, he never set a flipper on dry ground. One day, however, as he was lying half asleep in the warm water, somewhere off the island of Juan Fernandez, or Juan Fernandez, he felt faint and lazy all over, just as human, human people do when the spring is in their legs. And he remembered the good firm beaches of Novostoshna, 7,000 miles away. The games his companions played, the smell of the seaweed, 
the sea, the seal roar, and the fighting. That very minute, he turned north, swimming steadily as he went on, and he met scores of all of his mates, all bound for the same place. And they said, Greetings, Kotick! This year we're all hollow sticky, and we can dance the fire dance in the breakers of Lucanon and play on the new grass. But where, where did you get that coat? Kotick's fur was almost pure white now, and though he felt very proud of it, he only said, Swim quickly! My bones are all aching for the land. And so they all came to the beaches where they'd been born and heard the old seals, their fathers, fighting in the rolling mist. That night, Kotick danced the fire dance with the yearling seals. The sea is full of fire on summer nights, all the way down from Nova Stoshina to Lucanum, and each seal leaves a wake like burning oil behind them, and a flaming flash when he jumps, and the waves break in great phosphorescent streaks and swirls. That's a great word, that is. Phosphorescent. Mm -hmm. Then they went inland to the Hollis Chicky Grounds, and rolled up and down in the new wild wheat, and told stories of what they'd done while they'd been at sea. They talked about the Pacific, as boys would talk about a wood that they'd been nothing in. And if anyone had understood, he could have gone on away and made such a chart of the ocean as never there was. The three or four-year-old Hollis Chicky rumped down from the Hutchinson's Hill, crying, Hi away, youngsters! Go on! The sea is deep and you don't know all that's in it yet. Wait till you've rounded the horn. Ha! You yearling! Where did you get that white coat? I didn't get it, said Kotick. It, it grew! And just as he was going to roll the speaker over, a couple of black-haired men with flat red faces came from behind a sand dune, and Kotick, who'd never seen a man before, coughed and lowered his head. <laughs> the Hollis Chicky just bundled off a few yards and sat, staring stupidly. Huh? Am I here? The men were no less than Kerrick Booterin, the chief of the seal hunters on the island, and Potalamon, his son. They came from the little village, not half a mile from the seal nurseries, and they were deciding what seals they would drive up to the killing pens, for the seals were driven, just like sheep, to be turned into seal skin jackets later on. Oh! said Potalamon. Look! Here's a white seal! Kerry Booterin turned nearly white under his oil and smoke, for he was an Aleut, and Aleuts are not clean people. Then he began to mutter a prayer. Don't, don't touch him, Patalamon. There's never been a white seal since, since I was born. Perhaps it's old Zarov's ghost. Mm, he was lost last year in the big gale. I'm not going to touch him, said Patalamon. He's unlucky. Do you really think he is? Old oh, Zaros, come back. I owe him for some gold's eggs. Don't look at him. Hold on. Yeah, don't look at him, said Kerrig. Head off that drove of four-year-olds. The men ought to skin 200 today, but it's the beginning of the season and they're, they're new to the work. A hundred will do. Quick! Potanamon rattled a pair of seal shoulder bones in front of a herd of hollis chicky, and they stopped dead, puffing and blowing. <laughs> then he stepped near, and the seals began to move, and Kerrick headed them inland, and they never tried to get back to their companions. Hundreds of thousands of seals watched them being driven, but they went on, playing just the same. Kotick was the only one who asked questions, and none of his companions could tell him anything, except that men always drove seals in that way for six weeks or two months of every year. I'm going to follow, he said, and his eyes nearly popped out of his head as he shuffled along in the wake of the herd. The white seal's coming after us, cried Patalamon. That's, that's the first time a seal has ever come to the killing grounds alone. Hush, don't look behind you, said Kerrick. It is Zarov's ghost. I must speak to the priest about this. The distance to the killing grounds was only half a mile, but it took an hour to cover, because if the seals went too fast, Kerrick knew that they'd get heated, and then their fur would come off in patches when they were skinned. So they went on very slowly past Sea Lion's Neck, past Webster House, till they came to the Salt House, just beyond the sight of the seals on the beach. Kotick followed, panting and wondering. He thought that he was at world's end, but the roar of the seal nurseries behind him sounded as loud as the roar of a train in a tunnel. Then Kerrick sat down on the moss and pulled out a heavy pewter watch and let the drove cool off for thirty minutes, and Kotick could hear the few, the, the fog dew-dripping from the brim of his cap. Then ten or twelve men 
each with an iron-bound club, three or four feet long, came up, and Carrick pointed out one or two of the drove that were bitten by their companions or were too hot, and the men kicked those aside with their heavy boots, made of the skin of a walrus's, walrus's throat, and then Carrick said, Let's go! And the men clubbed the seals on the head as fast as they could. Hmm. Yeah. Ten minutes later, little Kotick did not recognise his friends anymore, for their... Oy, oy, oy. Their, their skins were ripped off from the nose to the hind flippers, whipped off and thrown down on the ground in a pile. Not nice, but these things do happen. There was enough for Kotick. He turned and galloped. A seal can gallop very swiftly for a short time. So that was enough for Kotick, yeah. He ran off, back to the sea, his little new moustache bristling with horror. A sea lion's neck, at there, at sea lion's neck, where the great sea lions sit on the edge of the surf, he flung himself flipper overhead into the cool water and rocked there, gasping miserably. <laughs> What's here? said the sea lion gruffly. For as a rule, the sea lions keep themselves to themselves. <sighs> scoot me. I can scoot me. I'm lonesome. Very lonesome, said Kotick. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. They're killing all the, the hollow sticky on all the beaches. The sea lion turned his head in shore. Nonsense, he said. Your friends are making as much noise as ever. You must have seen old Kerry polishing off a drove. He's done that for 30 years. It's horrible, said Kotick, backing water as a wave went over him and steadying himself with a screw stroke of his flippers that brought him up, all standing within three inches of a jagged rock edge. Hmm, well done for a yearling, said the sea lion, who could appreciate good swimming. I suppose it is rather awful from the, your way of looking at it. Well, if you see seals will come here year after year, of course the men get to know of it. And unless you can find an inland, an island, sorry, where no man ever come, you'll always be driven. I mean, isn't there any such island? began Kotick. I followed the Poltus, the halibut, for twenty years, and I can't say I found it yet. But look here, you seem to have a fondness for talking to your betters. Suppose you go to Walrus Islet and talk to C. Vich. He may know something. Don't flounce off like that. It's a six-mile swim, and if I were you, I should hole out and take a nap first, little one. Cody thought that that was a good advice. Good advice. So he swam around to his own beach, hauled out, and slept for half an hour, twitching all over as seals will. Then he headed straight for Wal Walrus Islet and a little low sheet of rocky island almost due, due northeast from Nova Sochna. All ledges of rocks and gulls' nests were where the walrus herded by themselves. He landed close to old Sea Vich, the big, ugly, bloated, pimpled, fat-necked, long-tusked walrus of the North Pacific, who had no manners except when he's asleep, as he was then, with his hind flippers half in and half out of the surf. Wake up! barked Kotick for the gulls were making a great noise. Ah, ah! Caca! Yeah. Walrus. Walrus is a big fangs. I need fangs. <laughs> I'm a walrus. What's that? What's that? said Seavich, and he struck the next walrus a blow with his tusks, and waked him up, and the next struck the next, and so on, till they were all awake and staring in every direction but the right one. Hi, it's me, said Kotick, bobbing in and out of the surf like a little white slug. Well, may I be skinned, said Seavich, and they all looked at Kotick, as you can fancy a, cl a club full of drowsy old gentlemen would look at a little boy. <laughs> Kotick didn't care to hear any more about skinning just then. He'd seen enough of it, so he called out, Isn't there any place for the seals to go where men don't ever come? <laughs> go and find out, said Seavich, shutting his eyes. Run away, we're, we're busy here. Kotick made his dolphin jump in the air and shouted as loud as he could, Clamita! Clamita! He knew that Seavich never caught a fish in his life, but always rooted for clams and seaweed, though he pretended to be a very terrible person. 
Naturally, the Chickies and the Gooverooskies and the Apatikas and the Kittywakes and the Puffins, who are always looking for a chance to be rude, took up the cry. And so Limishin, Limishin told me, for nearly five minutes, you could not have heard a gun fired on Walrus Islet. All the population was yelling and screaming, Kermita! Starik! Oh man! While Sievich rolled from side to side, grunting and coughing. <laughs> now will you tell me? said Koltik, all out of breath. Gronos! Gronos! I can't do an S. Sea cow! said Sievich. If he is living still, he'll be able to tell you. How shall I know Sea Cow when I meet him? said Kotick, shearing off. He's the only thing in the sea. Oh, that's not him speaking. He's the only thing in the sea uglier than Sea Vich, screamed a Burgomaster Gull, wheeling under Sea Vich's nose. <laughs> uglier and with, with worse manners. Sterig! <laughs> Kotick swam back to Novastoshna, leaving the gulls to scream. There he found that no one sympathised with him in his little attempts to discover a quiet place for the seals. They told him that men had always driven the hollow chicky. It was part of the day's work, and that if he didn't like to see the ugly things, then he should, he should not have gone to the killing grounds. But none of the other seals had seen the killing, and that made the difference between him and his friends. Besides, Kotick was a white seal. What you must do said old Sea Catch, after we'd heard his son's adventures, is to grow up and be a big seal like your father, and have a nursery on the beach, and then they'll all leave you alone. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, in another five years, you ought to be able to fight for yourself. Even gentle Mutka, his mother, said, You'll never be able to stop the killing. Go and play in the sea, Kotick. And Kotick went off and danced the fire dance with a very heavy little heart. And that's where I'm going to stop it for today. Better write down the accent someday. Or I'll totally forget tomorrow. <laughs> Ahem. Yes. Thanks for joining in. I'll catch you next time for another instalment of The Jungle Book. Although this isn't actually a jungle, but then you could say it's a jungle in the sea. I don't know. I'm going to bed. Good night. <laughs>